Yeah, you can lead those. Thanks. Um, thanks for that amazing introduction. Um, can we put that on our website? That was really great. Um, it's, uh, it's really nice to be here. In San, this is my first time in San Antonio, and um, I've been here for about six hours, and so far I, I really like the vibe. Um, and, uh, but thank you for the invitation to come here, and uh, really excited to have, a few, uh, have some time to talk to you about some of the work that I do uh, at my office, Interboro Partners. Um, I thought I would actually start um, by talking about baseball because I, I, it occurred to Ian and I on the way over here that tonight is the World Series and probably a lot of people are, you know, home watching the World Series. That'd be fine. In fact, I assume if you're a baseball fan, you're probably not here. You're probably watching the World Series. But I thought I could, I could sort of illustrate um, the, the title of this lecture through baseball. Maybe. We'll give it a shot. So uh, the, the name of this lecture is When Life Gives You Lemons. What the heck do I mean by that? Um, so this is, this is Fenway Park, right? This is like the best baseball park ever. Everybody loves it. And what makes, what makes it iconic? What's the most famous thing about Fenway Park? The green monster, right? So this thing right here. Uh, and it looks like this. Com so... One of the reasons why the Green Monster is there in the first place is because Boston, the stadium was built a long time ago, and the developers who built the stadium, they did a good job of buying most of the land to build the ballpark, but they couldn't buy out this property, right? They, it, they, and so they, they had two choices. They could find another site, or they can you know, make do, make lemonade with, with lemons. Uh, and they decided that they'd sort of stick to their guns, and they would build a Green Monster, a big wall in left field, because otherwise the distance between home plate and left field would be too low. So you build a tall wall, it's harder to hit home runs over it. it. Turns out to be a really great piece of architecture. It's probably the most iconic piece of architecture in sports. Contrast that with Dodger Stadium. Dodger Stadium where the city said, come on, come here, build a stadium. It can be absolutely perfect. Don't worry about anything. The perfect dimensions, all the parking you ever wanted to. You don't have to negotiate with any outside forces at all. What's the better stadium? Obviously, uh, it's Fenway Park. That's a little bit, kind of gets at what I mean by, uh, by uh, when, I, when, I, when I talk about when life gives you lemons. Sometimes constraint in design uh, is actually a virtue, and sometimes it leads to a lot of, a lot of creativity, and I think that's true with, with, uh, with Fenway Park. Uh, okay, so, uh, so I'm going to probably talk for about 45 minutes, maybe 50 minutes or so. Um, if you get bored, just let me know, and we can turn to Q&A. Um, but uh, I, I, and so in this talk, I'm going to be uh, talking uh, about some recent projects by my office, Interboro Partners. Uh, so let me start by telling you a little bit about Interboro Partners. Um, so Interboro is myself, Georgine Theodore, and Tobias Armbors. Uh, we uh, were about 10 years old, um, and uh, actually we're 11 years old. Um, and uh, we called ourselves Interboro mostly because um, it's a really ubiquitous name in New York City. Um, it's very everyday. If you look in the phone book, there's Interboro everything. But there was no Interboro architecture or uh, uh, Interboro design. So we thought we'd step up to the plate. We like the anonymity. We like the idea of being a part of the city, something that kind of seems just part and parcel of New York City. Um, so uh, so we, we, we like the name. Like the name Interboro, um, our firm, Interboro, does uh, quite a wide range of things. Uh, we work on a variety of project types with a variety of clients, a range of deliverables. So first of all, one thing we do is we design public space. Uh, for example, uh, this is a project called Lent Space. Um, it's, it's on Canal Street in New York City. It's a temporary sculpture park. The owner of this lot um, plans to build a big condo on the lot, uh, but for a number of complicated reasons, uh, he's not ready to do so yet, so we and some other nonprofits appro approach the developer um, about turning the site into a temporary sculpture park. It, it consists of about three elements. So there's this fence up here. Uh, there's this open space, which was uh, for, for art and uh, sculpture installations. And then there are these planter boxes that actually are growing uh, plants for the, the neighborhood around here. This is a temporary project. So we want to make sure all the, all the components had an, had an afterlife. Um, the fence, um, so here, here you see the fence. 
it is a kind of component. That, so the developer insisted on us fencing off the site. So he right off the bat dealt what we thought was a lemon. Uh, parks aren't good when they have fences, typically. Uh, so we just decided to make it a main component of the site. And so we made a nice, uh, so here you see it here, we made a nice front door with these fences that actually spin around and have a bench on them. Uh, so they're th this kind of playful element of the park. Um, the plant, here, here are the planter boxes on a normal day. These are open and define these nice paths through the site. Uh, so here you see it in operation. And here you see that fence being, being moved. It looks a lot harder to move than it does in this uh, it, picture, um, but uh, you know you can create a whole array of different social situations. This is another public space um, that we designed. This one for uh, this was an installation at the 2012 uh, Venice Biennale, um, and uh, basically we were asked to create a, a, a. It's called common space, common place, and basically we were asked to create a a, a space for. Uh, lectures and workshops and just, just plain hanging out. It's outside of the American Pavilion at the, at the Venice Biennale. Um, and so you see it's made with this deck and these, these orange cubes. So here's a rendering of it. The, the deck is actually we, we made out of these things called passerelle. If you ever been to Venice during the rainy season, they put these decks out because the city floods. And so they put out these temporary sidewalks. Um, and so we, we thought it might be fun to make, a de make the deck part of this installation out of these things. Uh, and then the cubes, we end worked these cubes that we, we worked with the local school and ended up giving, giving them away to a school after the, after the Biennale was over. So all these cubes kind of pack into this, into this um, deck and then they, you, can, you can take them out and do whatever you want with them. Um, but we basically made a deal with the city. We said, uh, if you would uh, give us the infrastructure for these, uh, for these passerelle, these decks, uh, Th then we would make the, the deck to spec and you can just take them and use them in the city. So today somewhere in Venice are all these passerelle and cubes kind of having a second life. But you can see all the different ways that you can arrange these things. Um, stadium seating, here it is uh, accommodating a crazy event. Um, kids love the, the cubes, they were kind of soft and, and fun to play with. Um, you get the idea. Okay, uh, and this more recently, this is just a quick project we did. Same idea, we do a lot of temporary projects, for better or for worse. So this is a, a, a pier in Manhattan that's gonna be turned into a park, but they, the park was gonna be two years away, so they said, could you just do something really quickly for not too much money uh, to make it a nice space? And so we got this recycled, um, these are uh, recycled scaffolding from, from construction sites. And then we got these trees that were uh, on, en route to a public housing site nearby. And we said, wait, before you bring them to the public housing, can you just store them here for like, you know, a couple months? And, and the, the nursery agreed. And so we got to sort of borrow these, these, these trees and make a nice, little, uh, a nice little rest stop. That's the name of the project, rest stop. Um, we do a lot of city planning and public participation is a very important aspect of all of our work. Um, we're not like, you know, architects who come in and say, this is how it's going to be. You know, we really like to talk to people and um, um, get genuinely so solicit good, good uh, input. We do a lot of research. Right now, a lot of our new research is about the experience of growing old in New York City. Um, the, we're, we're, we're experiencing the silver tsunami in New York City as the, as the boomers start to age. Uh, and we have to ask ourselves, how, how difficult is it to age in a city? We don't want our senior citizens to move to Florida. We want them to stay in, in New York because New York is diverse and that includes racial diversity and economic diversity and generational diversity too. So we've been looking at some of the challenges that come with growing old in New York City. The specific research is actually about these things. It turns out for reasons that I will not go into now that a huge number of senior citizens in New York live in towers in the park, this kind of Corbusian mid 20th century topology. It's a much maligned topology. A lot of people don't like these kinds of buildings, but uh, so Co-op City, 8,500 8, seniors live in Co-op City. These are either public housing or what are called limited equity housing cooperatives. Um, and so you see what some of these look like, but they actually work really well for seniors. Um, and as seniors age in them, we're finding that, that they're actually, they actually work very well. They're not what Le Corbusier had in mind, 
when, when he sort of uh, dreamed up this, this style of ur urbanity, but nonetheless, they work pretty well. The elevators work, work, work very well for the seniors, the balconies, all the lush green space. Um, yeah, they just work really well. And in fact, a lot of these buildings were built um, by labor organizers in, in the 1940s and 50s uh, for, their, for their workers. And so a lot of the people who live there now were former union employees. And so they're really into cooperation and union organizing. And if you go into these buildings, there's like murals of FDR and, you know, cooperation for service, not profit. It's, it's kind of really cool. And so the seniors are really organized in this way. And so what they've done in these buildings is they've started these things called NORCs. Um, NORC stands for Naturally Occurring Retirement Community. So the idea is they try to get money from the government to retroactively turn these buildings into senior centers so that they don't have to move to Florida. And it's, 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 it's proving very popular. What do they do with that money? They take over space on the ground floor for art classes and Tai Chi and bingo. Um, they, uh, they have you know, stores that so if seniors can't go to the store, they can come downstairs to the common space and buy you know, Raisin Bran for a, for a dollar or whatever. Um, you know, all kinds. They have financial literacy and you know, um, healthcare literacy, uh, and, uh, and they check in on people. That's the best thing, is that they, they, they all have social workers, and they, they know exactly who lives where and who should take their medicine and all this stuff. It's really incredible. So this is a research project we're, we're really excited about. Okay. Um, now, we do a lot of different uh, stuff. There are a few constants. Um, one, we're always very interested in how people use and transform places every day how the meaning and sometimes the form of a place or building is changed over time by people uh, or forces that are beyond the control of the architect. Two, we're very sensitive to what exists, to existing dynamics. We don't try to bring our, our biases with us when we approach a project. We try to be good listeners. Okay, with that, I'm going to talk about a project called Holding Pattern. Um, so, this is a project that we did in 2011 for the MoMA PS1 Museum. Um, and here's a drawing of it. I'll explain what this means. Um, so this is MoMA PS1, and this is their courtyard. And every year, some of you may know about this, but every year they invite an architect to come and do a, a temporary installation in this courtyard. Okay, so um, And the, basically, you, you, they give you some money, not enough, but some and uh, they say, transform the courtyard. There's really no rules. Provide seating, provide some shade, maybe some water for people to splash around in, and that's it. And do whatever you want. Uh, and um, it's for a summer. It's from June through August, and then it goes away. That's it. OK. Um, so here's, a, here's, here's uh, and it's, it's mostly for these parties. This is somebody else's crack at the PS1 riddle. Um, there's, this, you know, so on the weekends there are these parties. You know, thousands and thousands of, of people come to listen to the cool, coolest band of the day. This is somebody else's uh, project that they did. And when we first started thinking about what to do here, we thought, like, what happens to all this stuff? You know, like, it's a temporary project. What happens in August? Does it get thrown in the dumpster? Turns out a lot of this stuff actually gets thrown in dumpsters. So our first thought was that it probably makes, uh, uh, makes a lot of sense to, to recycle. But the second thing that we thought about was uh, PS1 is in Queens. Has anybody ever been to Queens, New York? Oh, awesome. All right. It's the coolest place ever, right? It's the most diverse, awesome, just greatest place. Um, and, you know, in some ways, MoMA PS1 is a good neighbor, but in some ways, it's not. Like, you know, it has this 16-foot tall concrete wall around it, which is, let's face it, kind of an FU to the neighborhood, right? In fact, the community board here is always trying to say, like, turn down that, tear down that wall, you know, it's ugly. And it's, it's kind of like a culture's in here and the city's out here kind of thing. And so um, we started to, we wanted to do two things. We wanted to recycle. We wanted to, in our own way, undermine the distinction between high culture and low city. We had an epiphany of sorts when we were here. This is, the, this is that FU wall here. This is um, a taxi stand right across the street. And the guy, the guy who runs it, um, in the summer, he puts out this 
structure here and he puts an awning over it and then he's got little trees and he's got picnic tables and stuff. And he, this is where we had a kind of aha moment. We said, you know what? We have to do something in the courtyard and, and basically the stuff that what we have to do there, seating and shade and place to hang out, people, that's what people are doing all over the neighborhood, right? It's the same thing. So why don't we just try to make matches? Instead of us trying to come up with, with some crazy thing that we're going to build, you know, in the middle of the courtyard, why don't we just try to make matches and ask people what they need and then see if that's something that could be used in the courtyard and then when the thing's over, we just give it to them, right? So it's a, it was a very, very simple idea. So we started talking to people. Um, so we, this is a guy, Eric, and he runs a ballet studio right across the street from the museum and we just said, hey, you know, we're doing this weird project and we've got this money and we want to make a crazy thing in the courtyard, but um, you know, we, we want to make it out of stuff that people in the neighborhood need anyway. And so we said, what do you need? And he said, oh, actually, you know, I, I just expanded my ballet studio and I have, these, I need, have these walls and I still need the ballet mirrors. Okay. Uh, moving on, we talked to this guy, Ozzy Laverne. He runs a Teamsters union right across the street from the museum. He just moved in. Let's face it, this place could use a facelift, maybe a few trees, some outdoor furniture. Um, he really wanted to kind of brighten up the place, you know. Um, so, you know, what do you guys want? They wanted a rock climbing wall, you know. We're tired of playing with this parachute. Okay. So we're talking to all these different people, and um, we talked to over 200 businesses in, in the neighborhood looking for matches. We talked to everybody. We didn't always make matches. We talked to the library. They gave us a list of books. We said, well... That's not what we're, we had in mind. Nobody wants to read books in the PS1 courtyard during the summer. But we made a lot of matches, and these, these are all the matches we came up with. It's a lot of just basic stuff, right? You know, uh, benches and chess tables and things, but, the, you know, pools and lots of shade trees. A lot of people wanted shade trees for their parking lots, but then weird things like lifeguard chairs and, you know, uh, rock climbing walls and things, and so, and mirrors. And we said, why not? So, this is, so this is all the stuff, these, these are all the, all the matches we made and all the stuff that, um, the ideas we got, and by now all this stuff is at, in all these places. This is the Iron Chef way, way to design, right? So does anybody know this show, The Iron Chef? The, so The Iron Chef says, you know, today you will cook with lobster brains. And then the chefs have to make a delicious meal out of lobster brains. They didn't pick lobster brains, but they have to make something delicious out of it. That, that's the kind of approach we took here to just make, make a delicious meal uh, out of whatever we got. Lemonade with lemons, whatever you want to say. Okay, let's take a look at what we, what we got. So here's the courtyard. Um, so there's three, three rooms. There's the tree room, the main room, and this little room. The tree room, you remember a lot of people wanted trees. We said, great, trees are great in the courtyard. It's really hot. Trees will cool everything down. So we just basically put them in these... Um, we, we put mulch on top of the trees. We didn't, we didn't plant them. We just put mulch on them. We packed them in with these straw bales, and uh, that was that. Um, here it is on a, on a party day, people hanging out in the tree room. It was great. It was mushrooms growing in there by the end of the summer. It smelled different. It was really nice. Here are the guys' ballet mirrors. We just made a little uh, minimalist. We try to aggregate all this stuff so that uh, create these experiences. Um, it was really trippy in there and fun. Um, so here's looking at transition between the tree room and the, what we call the rec room. So here's just some of that furniture. It's all movable. Um, most of it's movable anyway. We wanted to create a kind of fun social space in there. Um, we see a couple more trees that we put outside, chess tables. This is a uh, sort of, this was a, a breakdancing stage. Some guys from a graffiti organization wanted a breakdancing stage, but we punctured it with holes so it shot water out of it. Got some like little kiddie pools and you know some stools and things, chess tables. There's the lifeguard chair. We designed everything. We wanted to, we wanted everything to look like it came from the same. It was part of the family, right? We didn't want to just go out and buy stuff. We wanted to design it. So, um, so yeah. So here it is. We didn't we didn't the ping pong tables we bought. Um, <laughs> we couldn't design them so well. But here it is on on opening day. Um, so these are little pools and things and. You get the idea. 
One thing, though, is we, you know, we didn't want to, a lot of, if any of you have seen other projects, I mean, the stuff that people do every year is totally amazing. Um, but one thing that we did not want to do was put a gigantic object in the middle of the space, which is what people do every, uh, almost every year. Um, and that's fine, and that's a totally valid approach. But I think for us, it's not an architecture project. It's an urban design project. It's really about creating a social space for people to hang out and sit and stuff. And so we didn't want to like block the whole courtyard. We just wanted to make a kind of nice column-free space with lots of, lots of stuff. So it's a little, it's a little sparse. It's, you know, it's modest, I think, in comparison to some of the others. Um, but actually, no, it's not, because it actually it gets more complex. Hang on. OK, so here it is, here it is on, on opening day. Um, uh, lifeguards. Oh, here's a, your rock climbing wall. Kids hanging out on the rock climbing wall. Sandboxes and stuff, chess tables. Okay, you get the idea. We made these labels, um, which um, told you what everything was and where it would go. So you could always make the connection between the object and the people who were getting the object once the thing was over. We made little tags that we put on all the trees and all the objects. So you knew when you went in that this tree was you know, going to end up at the Forest Hills Library, uh, or this in this case, the New York uh, uh, Presbyterian Church. Um, and so we did this in a way to kind of get those people to come here to sort of check in on their stuff, and they did. Um, we made a little brand that we stamped all the furniture with. Um, we had a lot of events, too. Um, we, we, they have these big parties on Saturdays, and we said to the museum, can, can we do Sundays? You know, can, can we... Um, can we uh, program stuff on Sunday? And they said, well, we don't have money, but sure, you can do what you want. So then we turned it over to all the people we had been talking to, the 200 businesses, and we said, you guys want to do something at, you know, at MoMA? And they all said, sure. So um, you remember uh, our buddy Eric from the ballet studio? He actually brought in his, his students to do a performance in front of his new mirrors. So here they are uh, doing a performance. Um, we did a thing with the library um, they did a lot of readings and stuff. This is a, some, some place called the <laughs> New York Iris Center, which is right across the street. Um, and they did like a quilting workshop. One of, the things, one of the things that was cool about this was none of these people had ever been to the museum before, uh, even though they lived in the neighborhood. So it, in some ways, it was a way to, like I said, it, this sounds really uh, cheesy, but you know, kind of undermine that 16-foot tall wall and undermine this kind of high culture, low culture thing. Um, yeah, so we had the, so this is the Breakdancing Museum, uh, which is about to be demolished, actually. Uh, so they, they came over and hosted a b-boy workshop, and um, they taught people how to do aerosol art and stuff. This is my favorite day of the project, because this is really the clearest example, I think, of sort of undermining the wall somewhat, where these guys were able to come in and kind of show their work in the MoMA, um, which I think was cool. We took over the, book, the bookstore. Uh, of the of the MoMA and, and they said they asked us to like nominate our favorite books. What do we want people to sell? And we did, you know. Um, but so here's our you know the geography of opportunity or something, which is our selection. But we mixed that up with other people's selections. So the the ballet guy Eric, he said, oh, you got to sell this great book, Degas and the Little Dancer, you know. Um, so it's it's uh, there you go. Then we made a newspaper. And, um, and uh, yeah, so, so just showing stories about all the different people we met and, and what they're getting and why. <coughs> OK. So quickly, um, so remember our, our friends at the, at the taxi stand, they basically wanted some games and a ping pong table. Here's the ping pong table in the holding pattern. Um, and here's the ping pong table at, uh, in the fall. It's still out there. Uh, the guy who owns it, Mike, he actually is a ping pong champ. He's super good at ping pong. Um, so they hang out there uh, every day. These kids want, they had a new game room and they wanted a new, uh, they wanted a foosball table for it. Uh, so here's your foosball table. And then here it is. We actually had to buy them a new foosball table because the one at the courtyard got kind of trashed. But we made good on our promise. There it is. Um, there's our buddy Eric. He wanted his ballet mirrors. Here are the ballet mirrors in the holding pattern. Um, and here they are installed in his ballet studio. Our pal Ozzy, he wanted his trees in his picnic table. Here they are. Here's some of the trees in the holding pattern. And uh, here we are installing our first tree. We work with a group called the New York Restoration Project. 
we never, ever would have been able to afford to plant uh, 84 mature uh, oak trees <laughs> around, around Long Island uh, and, and Queens had we not had their support. So we actually planted 84 trees around the neighborhood thanks to this project. Remember our pals from the daycare center? They wanted their rock climbing well. Here it is. And then there it is, installed. The <laughs> kid looks a little scared, actually. <laughs> OK. So this is a senior center where they, there was this, this sort of barren plaza back there. And uh, we're grateful to have this plaza, but let's face it, it's kind of barren. Can you do something about that? So here's, here's some modernist furniture we made. And then, then here, here it is. Uh, here they are hanging out at it at the Ravenswood Senior Center. OK. The other element of this project is this, this uh, canopy thing. It's not, that, this, that was not something, nobody said, hey, I want a really big canopy. Uh, so this, that wasn't really part of this matchmaking thing. But we wanted, like I said, we wanted to create a column-free space. We thought the simplest way to do it was just with this kind of canopy, which I think looks kind of cool. But one thing I want to mention about it formally is that it's not, uh, it, all it does is it's just the same shape as the courtyard, right? So this is, this is the MoMA PS1. It's this kind of funny building, right? First of all, this is the grid. Uh, the grid gets messed up by Jackson Avenue, which sort of cuts, cuts it off and makes it an irregular shaped block. Then you've got this U-shaped building. Then you've got this guy who it, it kind of muscles his way into the property of the, of the PS1. And then you've got this 16-foot tall concrete wall. You already have this crazy shape. You don't need to like, go to your computer and generate some you know, crazy form. It's already there. So what we decided to do is just basically tie rope between the wall and the parapet of the building. We couldn't go over the airspace here, so boop, we just did that. And then we got this kind of cool form out of it. All it is is just the, it, revealing this, this form that already exists. It's kind of a found object. Um, so here's a study model of it. Um, and you know, it made some shade, made some nice shadows. It looks a little Calatrava-esque, which was the last thing we wanted, but whatever. Um, and it, the hard, the, uh, some, some hardware details, and you got a kind of glimpse of it when you walk, when you walk down the street. Um, and they have to be retractable, these things, because our engineer, like halfway through, said, oh, man, um, you know, if it gets really windy, you're going to have problems. So when we had this, this wind thing, and every time it got too windy, we had to go up. We had this crew of people who would go up and reel these things in. Um, so anyway, so that's that. Um, OK, cool. Now, I thought that it might be fun to talk about a really old project, a project that I actually don't talk about that much anymore because it's so old, it's embarrassing. It's from 2002. But I'm going to talk about it because I think it uh, kind of gets at, again, this theme of when life gives you lemons. Um, so um, this is the first project we ever worked on, actually, 2002. This group called the LA Forum for Urban Design. Uh, they held a competition called Dead Malls, which asked entrants to find a dead mall, document its decline, and then imagine a future for it. We thought this sounded like a lot of fun, and we entered. Uh, we actually started our company to do this competition. Um, and it proved very, I think, formative for us. Um, so after a tour of the tri-state, of the New York area's recent retail past, we, uh, we, we found our dead mall, the Duchess Mall in Fishkill, New York. Uh, it's a classic kind of regional shopping mall with your two anchors. The reason it died is because all of the growth in the 70s came from Poughkeepsie, and the mall was here south of, route eight, of Highway 84, so north is this way. And between when the mall got built and when the mall died, this happened. Every retail need you could ever have, right? You didn't have to go so far south as the dead mall. That and also it just was really ugly. And um, so we spent a lot of time in the parking lot. This is when we had a lot more time on our hands than we do now. And we just started to look around and see, like, yeah, it's, you know, it's a dead mall. Like, there's no stores in there, but it's kind of happening. There's like buses and people waiting for buses. And even this guy who was one of the few remaining businesses, he had a cleaners that seemed like a pretty good business. And he also had a bus stop there that porta potties and, you know, RVs and rigs and all kinds of stuff happening in the parking lot. It, it was clear that there was just 
a lot of things going on here, right? There's evidence that even though this mall had died, it wasn't entirely dead. There were people, uh, this guy who would show up every day and just, you know, <laughs> pick up garbage with his, with his little car. Uh, there was this guy who uh, set up shop and sold hot dogs, you know, in this dead shopping mall parking lot. And then there, we went on Sunday once, and it totally transformed. It was like the least dead thing in all of Dutchess County. Um, it, it was completely transformed into this, uh, this uh, flea market. So here you see, uh, the, this is, they got inside and they sort of took over a former uh, Sears. This is a stand set up by the, um, the mother of Eric Carr, who was the original drummer for Kiss, and she sold uh, Kiss memorabilia. Um, so we just started to like notate all the things that we saw there, and we sort of did this detective work, and, and we noticed that this was not a dead mall. You could call it that, but it really was the beginning of a strange kind of city, right? It was, it was something that we, that we, you know, and it turns out that the reason that this was happening was because the developer, the people who owned, the developers who owned this mall, they were land banking it. We talked to them. We said, what are you going to do with this thing? There's no stores left. They said, we have no idea, but we're not going to sell it. Because we think in 10 years it's going to be worth a lot of money and we're just going to sit on it and it's a tax write-off for us and whatever. Good for them. And it seems like it would be a bad thing for the community, right? Because they're left with this hulking carcass here. But the truth is, that because the developer wasn't paying any attention, they decided to do whatever they wanted with it, right? And so you see all, this, all these things, I mean, that, that started to happen. So we started to map all the activities around here. So this is the mall as a healthy patient. And so this is, it's 1974 when the malls opened. These actually were all, all the stores that existed there on opening day. This is it today. There's, a, there's the cleaners, there's these pad sites, there's a, there's a couple things going on, but it's pretty dead. Then there's an occasional spike on the weekend, right, where you've got, um, this is a map showing all the vendor stalls. It's actually really, really um, big. And then uh, you've got this, what we call the heart arrhythmia, where you just never know when like a classic car show is going to come out, you know, turn up and totally transform the, the, the space. We actually worked up a nerve to talk to some of the people, and it turns out that they're all um, thriving, not because the mall died, not in spite of the mall dying, but because of it. This guy sells hot dogs because Nobody pays attention, and he gets truckers who come off of Route 84. The truckers park. They take a nap. They can park where they're as long as they want. Nobody's paying any attention. He can sell. Uh, the, there's actually a gap um, between the, the two closest rest stops, so he does a really good business. This guy, Peter, who owns the cleaners, he also takes advantage of the fact that the mall had died. He basically convinced the bus company to set up shop outside of his cleaners, the way it works is he actually stays open on, uh, on the weekends. People come to buy tickets for the bus on Friday. The bus goes to Atlantic City, which is like a gambling mecca in New Jersey, Boardwalk Empire. Uh, and so they drop their dry cleaning off. They, go to, they take the bus to the city. They leave their car in the parking lot because no one's paying attention. Sunday, the bus comes back. He's there with their dry cleaning. They pick up their car and they go home. Win, win, win for everybody, right? Uh, so these are all the, we just these are all the people we talked to, and uh, what we try to do with this project um, was to basically use this land banking phase when the developer wasn't looking to introduce small, cheap, kind of feasible things that would incubate this kind of strange city. We try to develop a proposal endogenously out of nothing but the specific things that we found on the site, as banal as those things are. What we did not do was spend any time thinking about an overall vision or a master plan. Um, so, uh, so we just came up with a bunch of little things that made a limited amount of sense with the hope of growing or incubating this kind of strange city. Um, and we divided, so this is a whole bunch of these projects. I'm not going to really go through them too much, but just to give you an example, there was a, there was a, a graphic design company in one of these stores. And they, the mall was closed, but they used one of these doors to get in. So we thought, oh, that's interesting. What if we took these loading docks and just plugged in what we called a hot box? You know, it could have like office infrastructure in it. You could keep the mall, the, the mall closed. 
you have a new entrance here and you enter all of the stores through these existing doors, you make a nice permeable facade. You know, you bring in uh, office equipment and you could sort of plug in a little office in there. So here, here's, here's what that might look like. You could take as much or as little of uh, the store as you wanted. That's the kind of thing. You know, this was a, a club that we proposed at the behind the mall that kind of took advantage of this crazy Logan's Run-esque architecture um, and based it on having observed kids hanging out and drinking at the back of the mall because there's no neighbors and no one pays any attention. So great, good place for a, a funny little nightclub. Anyway, I don't want to go into too much detail. This is a, an idea for um, the landscape in front of the uh, in front of the um, uh, McDonald's. So here's a here's a McDonald's. Here's a bank, and this is just a simple proposal to make a little kind of quick stop uh, thing for everyday life. Uh, maybe put some sculptures in it. This is actually based on having watched people, you know, go into the McDonald's, order their food. Here they go. I'll, you know, they order a cheeseburger and they, they get out and they don't go home and they don't get out. They just sit in their car and turn the radio on and whatever. So we thought, oh, well, we can make a nice little environment for them to do that here. Uh, so, okay. So that's that project. But the point, the point is it's a clear example of when life gives you lemons, right? It's no, the, that it was a kind of a bad deal for the community, but in some ways, if, you, if you're an optimist about it, um, something else was happening there. A lot of, a lot of um, people don't like, you know, they, they would drive by this place and say, oh, that's a dead shopping mall and it, there's nothing going on there and um, we need to turn it into this or that. This, it's really important that you uh, investigate places and understand how they really function, right? Because they surprise you a, a, lot, of, a lot of times. Uh, and this one certainly did. And it points to, I think, a different solution for what could happen to, to, to dead shopping malls. Um, it went nowhere. Uh, no one bought into our idea, but it was, uh, was a, I think, a fun project to work on. Uh, okay, let me talk about another project. Um, and uh, let's see. Okay, so this is a project called, Re this project is hot off the presses. Uh, I just we just presented this project on Monday. Um, it's brand new. Um, it's the latest thing we've been working on. And um, it's, uh, it's a project that we did for uh, HUD, Housing and Urban Development. They have this competition called Rebuild by Design. It's not really a competition. They basically invited 10 teams of architects um, to uh, propose resiliency building projects in sandaged, sandy damaged areas along the, the, the East Coast. Um, we presented four projects, um, each, base, each based on a different coastal topology. So we had a big team working on this. This wasn't just us, but we were the leads on this. Um, and uh, we basically, we proposed four projects, uh, each based on a different coastal topology that offer a menu of options for vulnerable, low and medium income, low and medium density communities along the coast. Uh, so just to take the, just quick uh, collages of some of our ideas, this one for uh, living on, how to, how to live better on a bay in Nassau County, this one about living, living on the coast um, in New Jersey, this one about um, living more harmoniously with, a, with creeks and watersheds in northern New Jersey, and this one about Staten Island. Um, I'm going to just talk about one of these projects, or maybe two. Um, right now, uh, there's a jury deliberating, uh, and they're going to pick out one of these four projects for us to actually, to actually work on and build. So what's great about this competition, it's not an ideas competition. We, they asked us to define a problem, pick a site, come up, identify four things, that, four or five things that you want to work on, and, um, and, uh, and we'll deliberate and we'll pick one. So that's happening right now, so we should find out any day whether we'll be working in uh, Long Island, New Jersey, or, or wherever here. The project is called Grassroots Regionalism. What the heck does that mean? Um, uh, let me explain. Uh, res it's called Grassroots Regionalism, Resiliency Building in Low and Medium Density Lowland Communities. Um, what does this mean? Uh, so, um, well, planning and, uh, and, uh, and land regulation in the United States, as some of you know, is, is very local, and municipalities have the power to effectively chart their own course. 
uh, often without having to consider the consequences their land use decisions have for neighboring municipalities. So these are the 585 municipalities in New Jersey, ranked by size. Each one has its own land use. They can each decide what zoning, all, the, all that stuff. It makes it very, very hard to do any kind of regional planning, which is the kind of planning you need when you want to, say, protect people's homes along the coast from being destroyed by another hurricane. What happens? One town builds a levee, one town builds a seawall, one town builds a dune, and they all undermine each other. So it's a big problem. You need coordinated decision making, and it doesn't exist. So one of the things that this competition we're trying to do is kind of um, get pe help people understand the kind of need for, for regional uh, planning and thinking. Um, so, uh, so yeah, but uh, of course municipalities are very interdependent uh, and are connected in innumerable ways. As a simple illustration, imagine two municipalities in New Jersey located along the same creek. The upland community's decision to, say, zone for big box retail means more impermeable surfaces, which means more storm water, storm water runoff in the creek, which would result in a, a flood hazard in the lowland community. Is that fair? Especially because the lowland community can't do a thing about it. Um, regional decision making is required for resiliency. We can all agree on that. How can regionalism be achieved? Um, so our team really uses competition as a way to to develop this grassroots regionalism that uses design to help grow a consciousness about municipal interdependencies. Um, that's just one of the strategies we employ in this project. Uh, just to go through another, um, we all the projects we decided should be prototypical, right? Uh, said to make sure that they're max, maximally impactful, we identified design opportunities that are prototypical and catalytic. They can be implemented in one place, but they offer solutions uh, that are applicable elsewhere and that catalyze other desired outcomes. The emergency in the everyday. In each of our design opportunities, we wanted to make investment in flood protection also investment in everyday life. Architecture that protects us from the occasional disaster, for example, a terrorist attack or a flood, too often requires us to sacrifice things we enjoy about the more everyday non-disaster moments. An example, the bollards, barriers, guard booths, and other anti-terrorist ephemera that started popping up around lower Manhattan soon after the 9-11 terrorist attacks might protect us uh, somewhat from future attacks, but they also contribute to an environment that feels unpleasant, hostile, and militaristic. So here, everything we did is a win-win. It's good for the emergency. It's also good for everyday life. Um, we also, all of our projects also involve a kind of systems thinking and understanding the connectivity between urban and natural systems. Um, so we, I mentioned we decided, we, we got to choose what we wanted to focus on. We decided to look, not at New York City, we, des we decided to look at vulnerable, low and median income, low and medium density communities uh, representing a diversity of natural systems. So we, uh, so we looked first of all at communities that are vulnerable to sea level rise. This is a six foot base elevation that we took as our standard. Um, we looked at, um, a low and medium income communities. We looked at low and medium density communities. We did this because we like a challenge. Manhattan is, somebody's going to build a wall around it or protect it. It's not going to be flooded, right? I mean, but when you're dealing with some of these smaller coastal communities, there are a lot of questions, uh, a lot more questions. Um, we looked at social vulnerability. I don't have to explain all this. We also looked at communities with critical infrastructure. Um, uh, for example, sewage treatment plants that are always located in these low-lying, low-income communities. Sewage treatment plants because they're gravity-based um, and they need to be near the water. So we sort of overlaid all of those things, singled out uh, a couple of areas that we thought we wanted to work with, um, and came up with this is just a complicated rubric for basically deciding where we wanted to spend our, our time. Uh, and we came up with a number of different places. But we also wanted to ensure that um, we our projects were on different coastal topologies, so um, we wanted to look specifically at creeks, marshes, bays, and the oceanfront because these are four natural systems that people tend to live on a lot uh, on the East Coast. So uh, here are the creeks. Here are the creeks overlaid with the hot spots. Freshwater marshes. There aren't too many actually, but here they are overlaid with the hot spots, giving us a couple of potential sites. Um, we looked at bays, 
Long Island, New Jersey, again overlaid with those hot spots, giving us a couple of good potential sites to work in. Um, and then the ocean front overlaid with the hot spots as well. So with that, we basically picked a number of sites. We had it, we we decided to use a, a couple of um, uniform solutions, uh, tools basically, uh, that we applied in every situation. Um, so the first we call moving on up. Uh, give residents of low-lying, low-opportunity, low-income communities the opportunity to move on up to high and dry, high-opportunity areas by identifying appropriate sites. One of the best things we could do to create more resiliency uh, in the region is to create more opportunities for people to live in high and dry, high-opportunity communities that are less prone to flooding. Um, simple. Living with the landscape. Um, Restore the natural functions of coastal landscapes in a way that simultaneously strengthens them as attractive, accessible public spaces. Um, so, for example, um, to think of a creek, it has an important ecological function, but it can also be uh, an import, it could also turn into a recreational amenity. And so we did that in all of our projects. Uh, and Protect Plus, we thought that it was important to always protect regionally. Uh, critical infrastructures from flooding in ways that would have a direct benefit to people living in, uh, in the vicinity of these critical infrastructures. Low and in, uh, medium co uh, income communities host a disproportionate number of the, of the region's uh, sewage treatment plants and therefore uh, really bear a disproportionate burden of the negative externalities like pollution and uh, feces overflowing into your streets uh, that these facilities produce. Um, so. Just to give you one example of a kind of project that we have identified, living with the creek, options for Monmouth County watershed. So um, basically, um, these are, there are a bunch of creeks. This is Monmouth County. Uh, oops, excuse me. Sorry about that. Uh, I got my timer on. Um, so, uh, so basically, um, there are a number of creeks that flow from, from highland communities up here. Uh, towns like Hazlitt and Marlboro, down to low-lying communities here, uh, mostly low-income communities, and then out into the Raritan Bay. Um, and the, these creeks don't know political boundaries, but the people who live in the community surrounding them do. So by point of comparison, uh, consider the low-lying community of Keensburg here um, and the upland community of Hazlitt uh, up here. Hazlitt's high and dry, didn't suffer much damage during the, during the Sandy. Keensburg is not high and dry, and it uh, experienced quite a lot of damage. Um, Keensburg's median family income is about half that of Hazlitt's. The schools were rated an A by the Department of Education in Hazlitt and a D in Keensburg. And according to the Municipal Opportunity Index, which rates quality of school, quality environment, quality of uh, municipal services, quality of housing. Hazlitt is a maximum opportunity and Keensburg is a minimum opportunity place. These differences really uh, played and came into focus during and immediately after Superstorm Sandy. The low areas, not surprisingly, fared the worst. First, because they're low-lying and receive all that runoff water from up here, and of course also because they got flooding from the front, from, from a surge that came. So they were hit in both directions. Um, over a thousand homes were damaged in Keensburg. Uh, only 46 up here in Hazlitt and Holmdale. Uh, so you could see some news st new stories of the devastation uh, down there. And, but nonetheless, despite the differences in these towns, during the emergency, people up here in their, in their different towns that don't typically care or think about Keensburg or Union Beach or Keensburg, even though they're in the same watershed, they thought that it was important to collaborate. And we wondered, um, was there a way to encourage this kind of intermunicipal cooperation apart from emergencies? And so for this project, what we're proposing to do is make a connection between these low-lying towns and these upland towns by playing up the natural connections that already exist there, namely these creeks that are the spine of the watershed, 
Um, and uh, we want to leverage them to kind of create this upland-downland connection. Um, so uh, we want to first um, make room for this creek by widening the creek bed um, and, and uh, strengthening it, restoring some of its original function. Um, and so we want to, want to sort of do something like this, but, but also use that as a public space. Remember um, that green arrow from before? Um, and so we have ideas here for how we might encourage people who are in the creek, which are the most vulnerable sites, to give them incentives to actually move to vacant lots um, uh, off-site. Off um, we also have an idea to take this Route 35 and kind of turn it into a gutter that could absorb water that's coming down the hill. And we would kind of do that by any number of ways, more storm water detention on site, which could also create to a kind of softening of this, what is presently just a strip mall, um, create smart streets and gutters and so on and so forth. Um, the other thing we want to do though is, like I said, identify sites for affordable housing upland in these communities like Holmdale and Hazlitt. Again, these are communities that have good schools, that have, they're high and dry, they have great jobs. Uh, they have stable home values, things that these communities don't have. This is not a call for managed retreat and saying everybody out of here, move back, but it's trying to create an opportunity to, for, for living. Um, and there are a lot of underutilized sites that actually are near public transportation in these, in these wealthier towns. Now you might say, well, how are you going to do that? Why, in, why on earth would a town like Holmdale want affordable housing to be built there? The answer is they have to be. New Jersey has a very strong affordable housing laws, fair share requirements that say each town needs to accept its fair share of affordable housing. It happens that these three towns have not done their fair share and they effectively owe the state thousands of units of affordable housing. So it seems like a win-win. But, and then this, is, this will be my last slide, but the, the or close to the last slide. But um, the, this condition where you have low-lying, low-opportunity areas connected by natural features to high and dry, high-opportunity places with affordable housing uh, obligations exists all up and down the coast. So again, this is a project for one particular place, Union Beach and Holmdale and all these places, but we think that it's a replicable idea um, that that could happen all up and down the coast. Um, I have been talking for... I think a long time, 52 minutes. That means I'm going to stop. Um, and just, uh, there's, you know, I could talk all day and I have a million projects, but I think that's, you get the idea, right? Um, so I'd be happy to take questions if people have questions. <laughs> or applause. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. Um, right off the bat, I mean, for us, the most fun part of a project is when you, you go to a site and you know you're going to do something there and you have a program, but you don't know exactly what you're going to do. Um, and, and we try to get all of our ideas by talking to people and meeting community groups and doing what we call intercept surveys, so just talking to people on the street, setting up a table and saying, um, you know, hey, we're, we've got some money to do this thing here, and what should we do? We, we, we never go into a project with a preconceived idea of what we're going to do. I mean, obviously, sometimes we're given money and said, build this here, but there's still a lot of wiggle room there. And, um, and for us, that's, that's the most fun part, and it happens right in the beginning. Other questions? Yep. I have a question. I grew up by the uh, beach in Southern California. Uh huh. This in Los Angeles. Yep. Uh, in Manhattan Beach, California, about a year, not far from the airport, if you know that. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been treated in very conservative fashion. It's clear that poor people are living close to the ocean. And Southern California and Mexico still live on land. 
Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's 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 a good question and it's complicated. First, there are there are places like Union Beach and Keensburg, all up and down the coast, poor places, very vulnerable. But for every Keensburg, there's a Manilokin, or you know, a very wealthy beachfront community. That's true in New Jersey, that's true in Long Island, that's true in Connecticut. So there is a mix. But your question is still good because why haven't rich people come in and sna you know, snapped up all those properties in Union Beach and Seaside Heights and all these places? I think um, in some ways it, it starts, um, most of these communities that are really vulnerable, Long Island, if you go out to Long Beach and Island Park, these are places that started out as little bungalow colonies and things, and they, they never were, you know, people would go there, they'd spend a summer, they'd shut it up, and then they'd go back to New York and live. And only over time did a lot of these places become um, res full-year residences. So I think, but because of that, they sort of built up out of bungalow communities, and um, they, uh, they're modest. They're fairly modest, they, and the, the, ha the homes are modest. There is, um, you are seeing now in New Jersey, uh, a lot of wealthier people kind of scoop, coming in, buying these houses, tearing them down, and building big mansions on the lot. Um, and in fact, the, the population of the barrier islands in New Jersey is going down. The proportion of, th that there's more seasonal homeowners now than, than renters. So we're starting to see a change. Um, but for most of these people, these are second homes, right? And so they can, you know, and they have, typically have money so they can afford to take more of a risk on them. Um, but, it, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's true. I mean, it, and it's, it's probably it's complicated, and I, I can't fully answer the question. I'm sure there's a really good book about it somewhere, or maybe a dissertation. That's a good, yeah. A lot of them were. All this is fill. All, all the communities we were looking at um, really built on a lot of fill. Um, I mean, the Staten Island, we were looking at a community that was built on a marsh. You've got a lot of people living where people really shouldn't be living, you know, and that's, that's the problem is you can't, but you can't say, get out of here. You, you know, you, you can, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't be very popular. And people, What's interesting is if you go, but if you go to places that are really vulnerable and been slammed a number of times, like a good example is a place called uh, Oakwood Beach in Staten Island. Nor'easter in 92, Marsh Fire in 97, Hurricane Irene, Hurricane Sandy. When, when Hurricane Sandy hit, the people in Oakwood Beach, they organized, they got together, and they said, get us out of here. They worked with the governor. The governor made them an offer. He bought out all their houses at pre-storm value, and every single person in that neighborhood split. And they were all happy to do it. If you go to New Jersey or if you go to the Rockaways, these places, these are places who get hit once in a while, but not every five years, like Oakwood Beach. They're kind of like, nah, you know. In fact, the slogan in New Jersey is, we're stronger than the storm. That's Chris Christie's slogan, stronger than the storm. And, and we'll rebuild back and we'll be better than ever. People don't really, I think, fully understand like the the devastation that's about to come with rising sea levels, with increasing storms. And I'm not, you know, I, I totally get it. People have lived in these places. They want to hand these kids to their ancestors. They grew up in them. There's memories. It's really hard to say to people that they shouldn't live where they do, which is, but which is the, in Oakwood Beach, it only worked because it came from the bottom up. People there decided on their own accord, we want to get out of here. There's very few examples of 
successful forced retreat, saying, you guys, get out of here. It's been done, but it's very unpopular, and, and uh, not too many politicians want to do that. So it's, and, th and this is why we wanted to work in these communities. Nobody's, nobody's telling uh, you know, down, mid downtown Manhattan and Battery Park City, get out of there. Right? It's, it's just there's too much money, there's too much investment there. When you deal with these medium density communities and these kind of lower income communities where people also, it's not that they just don't want to retreat and move somewhere else. They can't. They don't have the money. They don't have the resources. They don't have the resources to build homes higher and elevate to flood, existing flood levels. Um, so it's just a crazy challenge. Um, so that's, so, um, yeah, anyway. Are there any other questions? Uh, yep, and then, yeah. Um, with the project with the mall, um, I saw that you had a picture of the guy throwing hot dogs. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, you know, you would have to have permits and things like that yeah. to throw hot dogs. And my question is, is if he's doing that, if, did he have a permit? And if he didn't have a permit, by building a mall, like what your plan was, and it would generate more business, so that it, and it would affect, hurt his business. Uh -huh. So did he like that, the plan of, you know, redoing the mall and, going on with the project or did they, the people that you yeah. talked to that kind of used the mall for illegally, did mm -hmm. they, how did they feel about the whole project? Well, we, so they didn't feel either way because they didn't ever know about it. <laughs> so, this was, you know, this was a kind of, theor uh, I don't want to say theoretical, but it was a uh, theoretical project. <laughs> we did talk to them. We did talk to him. But it, was, it, it, it wasn't like we got hired by the, kid, by the town and given some money and said, hey, do something with this mall. We were, we were young and we were hungry and we wanted to you know, put, a, put a good idea on the table. And so that was that project. It was purely speculative. But we designed, we, the, whole, the point of the project was to make the mall work for people like that. Um, to say that, look, you always got to work with what works. That's endogenous development is a fancy word for that. Work with what you got. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. Don't come in and say, oh, this should be an office park. You know, let, let people sort of be the clue, um, right? And in this case, the pro we try to make a project, theoretically, that all of these different people, the cleaner guy, the hot dog guy, the guy in the golf cart, that all of these people would, would like and support and would benefit them. Um, you can do that kind of stuff when it's a theoretical project. But there's a thesis in there, I think. And, and, and it also, that project informs every project we do. It really, I think, is for us. And I, I would say to those of you who, um, you know, are you know, starting to think about going into practice and stuff, competitions are kind of, kind of a good, good thing. They, they're a little exploitative, and you, you'll, you'll spend a lot of time um, working and the odds of you winning the competition are not going to be good and sometimes if you win it's you just get featured in a magazine and a thousand bucks and you know. but it, for us um, starting out in you know 2002 we did a lot of these competitions because not this one we did a lot of ideas competitions because they helped us kind of formulate our ideas and come up with things that we believed in so we really built on them so I think you know if you can swing it they're 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 fun, and they're, they're, they can be good and help. Uh, yeah. um, as I read your research, it shows the examples that you gave as far as how to overcome like remedies and that kind of uh -huh. thing. So I guess my question is, is uh, being out there in the real world and all your experiences, what is one of the most, or some of the most common lemons that you will get and have to overcome or something like that? Yeah, that's good. Um, the biggest, no doubt, the biggest lemon that we face as, as architects who are interested in urban planning issues, and I think uh, that urban planners face, there's a slide of it here somewhere, where the heck did it go, um, is, is this one, <laughs> right? It, there, it's impossible to think, to. And this isn't a good, you can't make lemonade with this lemon. Just, you know, it's just, <laughs> because it's just um, 585 towns in New Jersey, each that have its own 
land use and can each say, I want a dune, I want a seawall, I don't want affordable housing, I don't want any industry, no highways through here, whatever. You, the, when you need to make big decisions, the kind of decisions you need to make when you're thinking about how to protect a coast from flooding, or big decisions like how do you um, get poor people with, uh, out of places with no opportunity and get them out into the places that have the good jobs and all the, uh, and the clean air and that aren't flooding and um, all this stuff. When you, you can't think about that at a, at a little piece by piece level, you've got to think larger. It's only, only in Portland do we have a regional government that can make land use decisions. We have, there's regional planning and, uh, but it's in New York and everywhere, but it's always just advisory. When it comes down to it, if you want to get something done, this and this and this one and this one and this one, has to, they all have to agree. It's impossible. That's the biggest challenge we all face, I would say, as planners. You kind of already yeah. answered this, but the rapids, what is, do you think people try to get their own sense of town for the city? Mm -hmm. Or is it hard to say, hey, we're not going to do this because of this? Oh, yeah. Good question. <laughs> it's so complicated because there are, um, there's different, it, basically, so you see here, like the, the purple is borough. This is township, city, town, and village. Um, so they're basically um, just different types of towns. Like in Long Island, there's villages, hamlets, you know, cities, and every, most states have, have different ways to categorize places, and so this is just categorizing them, um, categorizing them differently. One time for one more? Or one. Quick one? Yeah. I won't give such a long answer this time. Yeah. No, I didn't, but I could say very quickly I think there's two, um, at least two schools of thought that influence us. One, I think we're very influenced by a lot of the. Um, Postmodernism, well, not postmodern architecture. We really like uh, Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown. And I think we're very interested in the commercial vernacular. Um, very influenced by there's someone named Margaret Ca Crawford, who teaches at Berkeley now. She uh, taught us all at Harvard, wrote a book called Everyday Urbanism. Yeah. And um, she's very interested in this kind of stuff, <laughs> I think. And yeah. Exactly. Like ordinary, um, the first, yeah. Uh, exactly. Oh, I, I totally, I totally agree, and um, yeah, um, uh, definitely. And I mean, the first line of learn, learning from Las Vegas that it's you know revolutionary for an architect to learn to look at what's there, or something like that. You know, and and I think that that that's that's not, the one thing I'll add is that the other part that's really crucial to us, and that I think we do that I think you that is lacking in that discourse is we we're really political, like we really believe in just in social justice, and in all of our projects. We really um, try to, you know, could do our best to contribute to a more equ equitable society. I think that kind of stuff is, is a little bit lacking in, in some of the, the postmodern um, discourse. And, uh, but I mean, we're super political. And I think the, you know, we have a book.
coming out in the spring that's all about uh, accessibility and thinking of it. It's, a whole, it's, a, it's an encyclopedia of 202 <laughs> things that cause segregation or integration. <laughs> and, it's, and so that's a, that's a topic that really is very, very um, central to our work. Um, and so, yeah. Okay. Oh, cool, man. I yeah, what's your name? Donovan. Donovan? I have family from New York, so my mom, she oh, awesome. grew up in Queens, Jackson.